Welcome back to another video, and in this video, I'm gonna break down step-by-step -step how to comp a property in 2023. So if you're a wholesaler, or you're trying to get into wholesaling real estate, or maybe you've already wholesaled a bunch, then I'm gonna show you actually how to comp a house properly, okay? And I see so many wholesalers that do it wrong, or they don't know how to comp a house, or they don't know how to do it like an appraiser would do it. And really, at the end of the day, you have to know how to comp a house like an appraiser, uh, because an appraiser is going to be who actually runs the numbers on the back end. And if you're brand new to my channel, my name is Austin Zabak, and I actually have been wholesaling real estate for about nine years now. And uh, in those nine years, I've done over 2,500 wholesale deals. I now have a team of over 65 people, and we wholesale anywhere from one to two houses every single day. I've also flipped a bunch of properties and I run a big retail organization as well. And we do other things in the real estate community. So if you're brand new to my channel, I would greatly appreciate it if you would subscribe if you have not already and smash that like button. Now let's just go ahead and jump right into the video. So obviously you know why you need to comp a house. If you do not understand how to comp a house or you think that maybe you're doing it wrong, um, it's actually a really big deal, right? Uh, primarily because you're gonna waste a lot of time if you're locking up properties at the wrong number. And I see wholesalers do that all the time, right? Where they go and they think they can pay a certain amount and they negotiate with the seller uh, and they, do, uh, they put in a bunch of work only to find out that they locked the property up way too high. And they typically end up figuring that out when they go sell it to a cash buyer and the cash buyer is like, hey, you know, I'm definitely not going to be anywhere near that number, right? And now the wholesaler has to go do a price drop with the seller. And they could have avoided all of that if they just knew how to run the numbers. So obviously that's one big reason why you need to know how. There are a ton of other reasons. Um, it will actually help you if you are a flipper or you've ever thought about flipping. Uh, you need to know what the property is going to sell for, right? So we always have to know, okay, what is the property worth right now? And then once I put a bunch of money into it and I fix it up and I do all the things that I have to do to it, you know, what will that property sell for on the open market with a realtor? So without further ado, let's just go ahead and jump into the video, okay? So uh, what we're gonna be talking about today are going to be the appraisal rules that you need to understand if you want to do everything that we just talked about, okay? So we're just gonna go through it one by one and if you wanna take notes, I definitely would take notes, okay? So, um, and by the way, I'm happy to do another video about this in the future and break it down in more detail or actually show you in real time how I implement this when I'm actually comping a property, okay? So you have your subject property that you're looking at, right? And if you're watching the video, I'd encourage you while I do this to go ahead and pull up your subject property, right? If you're driving, don't do it. Uh, but if you're on your desktop, go ahead and pull up a property that you want to determine the MAO, okay, the maximum allowable offer on the property, or you're trying to figure out um, what it would be worth when it is all fixed up, set, and done, aka the ARV, right? The after repair value, okay? So go ahead and pull up the property. You've got it in front of you, 123 Main Street. Now let's figure out what it is worth, okay? So we're going to start by looking at all the sold comparable properties um, that basically fit with the criteria that we're about to talk about that have sold typically ideally as most recent as possible so i always want to start with sold properties that fit that criteria okay which we're going to talk about that sold in the last 90 days okay now if the subject property that you're looking at doesn't have uh, uh sold properties that have sold in the last 90 days then you can obviously go further back you can go 180 days. Um, just keep in mind that the further you go back, the more inaccurate the number could be, right? Because obviously if the market is fluctuating, um, you know, you can't go too far back, right? Like for example, at the time of filming the video, it is May 12th and about a year ago, okay, May of 2022, the market was at an all time high and then it kind of went to crap for a couple of months, okay? Like June, July, August, September, pretty much the remainder of 2022 was garbage, okay? Depending on where you lived. So um, anyways, jumping into it, you can't typically look at a comp that is uh, greater or less than 200 square feet of a difference of the subject property. So if you have a thousand square foot property, you cannot compare a thousand square foot property to a 1400 square foot property, right? You also can't compare a thousand square foot subject property to a 600 square foot property, right? 
So a thousand square feet, we want to compare it no greater than to a 1200 square feet house and no less than to an 800 square foot home for the most accurate number, obviously, okay? Um, the comparable has to be within five years of construction of the subject property. So if your subject property was built in 1950 and the guy across the street's house just sold for whatever it sold for, but their house was built in 1990, then that is not going to be a good comparable property, right? Because it is a totally different era of when the property was built, okay? So you want to make sure that you're comparing apples to apples when you're trying to comp a property, okay? Um, we always want to look at the same property type, so we never want to compare a single story to a two story um, or vice versa. It is typically not going to be very accurate, okay? Um, single stories and two stories are worth uh, they, they, they come in and the valuations are completely different, okay? Um, the lot size, we want it to be within 2,500 square feet, okay? So uh, I don't want to compare our subject property to a sold comparable that has a lot size greater uh, than 2,500 square feet of our subject property, okay? Um, we don't want to cross any major roads, ideally. So if we're looking at a subject property, and I see this is probably the most common thing I see all the time, okay? Um, I probably see that more than I see anything on this entire list, okay? What people will do is they'll have a subject property, and in order to figure out what they're going to make an offer on that subject property for or uh, what the ARV is, they will cross a major road, and they'll find a comparable or what they believe to be a comparable in a neighborhood across a major road. And most of the time, that is not going to yield an accurate number, okay? Most of the time, if you cross a major road, it is gonna be a different subdivision, a different neighborhood, a different builder, okay? And everything about that property across a major road will typically be different, and therefore, will have a different value or a different ARV, okay? Which will obviously affect your MAO if you're trying to wholesale real estate, okay? So um, do not cross a major road unless you absolutely have to, meaning you cannot find any sold comp in your subdivision, which we're gonna talk about um, right here, right? Don't leave the subdivision. In an ideal world, you wanna find a comparable sold comp in the same subdivision. And on the MLS or on Monsoon or Zillow or whatever, you can actually filter for the same subdivision. And the reason that that's important is a lot of times, if you're in the same subdivision, you will have the same exact builder, right? Whenever they built that subdivision, that builder would have probably built those houses at a similar time. The construction would have been similar. Um, all the materials that they used to build the property would have been similar. And everything about the two properties would be similar, okay? If it is on a busy road, we wanna typically take off about 20%. Um, on homes that are over 500 grand. Okay, we're gonna talk over here in a minute. Um, if you are on a major road, let's see, fronting traffic, um, under 250K uh, price of the home, then we'll just take off about 15K roughly, um, as opposed to 20%, because obviously it is a cheaper home. Okay, so um, in that scenario, 20% uh, would have been like 50 grand. But if the house is under 250K, right, then we don't want to take off that much. Um, but again, what I want to preface here with it being on a busy road and the 20%, um, I love having kind of these generic numbers. Take, take some of that with a grain of salt, right? Obviously, um, appraisers are going to appraise using a lot of this same stuff, right? But um, it can vary depending on where you're at, right? So, um, you know, that will vary if like, Let's just say you're in Atlanta compared to Arizona or you're in North Carolina compared to Indianapolis or you're in you know, Miami, Florida compared to uh, wherever, you know, that could obviously look different, okay? Um, plus minus a 5K for a carport, okay? Um, so we wanna make sure we keep that in mind. So if we're comparing our subject property um, has a carport and our comparable property has a, like let's just say a two car garage, but this one has a two car carport, then we'll subtract $5,000 from um, the ARV of what we believe our subject property will be, okay? Um, plus 10 minus 10,000 for a pool. Um, that one is actually really fascinating to me uh, because I live in Arizona and I know for a fact that building a pool costs like minimum like 30 or 40 grand, um, but typically appraisers will only adjust plus or minus roughly about 10,000 for your average sized pool, okay? So um, if your subject property does not have a pool, 
and your comparable property, the property that you're comparing it to, to determine the ARV has a pool, then you want to adjust down roughly $10,000 in ARV for your subject property, okay? Um, so uh, pretty simple there. And then plus minus 5K for a bedroom. So if you can't find a, an exact match, right? Obviously, um, it should go without saying, but when comparing a subject property to a comparable property, one of the biggest things that I wanna do always is try to compare apples to apples when it comes to bedrooms and bathrooms, okay? That should go without saying, obviously, uh, but you know, if you can't find, like let's say your subject property is a three bed, two bath, right? And that's obviously really common, um, depending on where you live. And let's just say you can't find a sold comp that's a 3-2, right? You can only find one that is like a 2-2, two -two, right? Or a 4-2, okay? Then plus minus 5,000 uh, for that bedroom, okay? Um, again, we're gonna get into the traffic a little bit. Um, these ones basically, I don't know if you can see, but it's just minus 10K for traffic, backing, and siding under 250,000, okay? Minus 15,000 for fronting traffic under 250,000. Minus 20,000 for backing freeway, okay? We see that quite a bit, um, where the house is literally, like there's a freeway in your backyard, okay? Um, and again, take that with a grain of salt. I, I've, I feel like I've seen people um, have to subtract way more for that. Uh, but, you know, again, it, it, a lot of it just depends on the market you're in and if a buyer is willing to buy the property at the end of the day, right? Um, and then plus minus 10K for garage under 250,000. So there you have it, okay? That is kind of the appraisal rules that you will typically see when an appraiser is going to appraise a property, right? Um, and again, you wanna know that obviously if you're a wholesaler, you wanna know how to run numbers on a deal, right? There's nothing worse than not understanding the numbers of a deal and then you do your math wrong, right? Because again, you've gotta remember, once I determine what the ARV is, right? In order to figure out my MAO, right? If you're wholesaling, is I gotta take that ARV, which again, we'll only know by doing all the appraisal rules and trying to figure out what the ARV is. To determine the MAO, I've gotta then subtract, obviously, repairs, right? And I've gotta subtract, uh, you know, closing costs, right? And I've gotta subtract, you know, the profit that I wanna make if I'm a wholesaler, right? If I'm a flipper, I've got to subtract the flipper profit, right? So what's the flipper want to make, okay? So they might want to make, you know, 10% or whatever they want to make, right? And then obviously um, realtor costs, right? Which could go with closing costs. And then that'll typically give me the MAO, okay? Which is the maximum allowable offer. So the only way to figure that out is obviously by understanding the front side of the board, okay? So um, again, uh, the video is more about the appraisal rules, so I don't wanna get too much into the other side, uh, but I hope that you got a lot of value from that video. Um, if you've ever wanted to learn more about wholesaling real estate, uh, we actually have uh, a course, okay, an education program, a coaching program uh, that we have, and I'll link that down below. It's called Flippin' Simple, and it is a phenomenal, phenomenal coaching program. Definitely recommend you go check that out. Link in the description. Also, if you haven't already, it would mean the world to me. Subscribe, smash that like button, drop in the comment section what other videos you would like me to make. I'd be happy to make them, and we'll see you in the next video.